The Pale Lady I was 10 when I told my mom about the pale lady in the wardrobe. She had long limbs and paper white skin. She killed Marlene, my babysitter, right in front of me, and I watched as she dragged Marlene's body into the wardrobe. She smiled at me as she climbed in after her. I told mom everything. I told her to get help and call the police. We could save her if we tried. We could help Marlene. But mom didn't believe me, nor did she care. Mom was very drunk and relieved she didn't have to pay Marlene for watching me. She waved me away and pulled the man she had brought back into her room. She closed the door in my face. She believes now, though. Oh yes, she does. But too little too late. It should have been her. I'm upset and scared, but more than anything, I am pissed. My mother's stubbornness has irrevocably broken so many people. My baby sister is the biggest victim of it all. I know we won't ever find her. As I've said before, Marlene was my babysitter. She was very nice and also very dumb. She once asked me what the Spanish word for tortilla was. Mom loved to date almost as much as she loved to drink. Almost. Is it sad to say that I saw Marlene more than mom? If so, too bad because it's the truth. Mom was on another date that night. She told us not to wait up for her. Marlene and I were watching TV in the living room. She had put a frozen pizza in the oven and went to check on it. She was in the kitchen for less than a minute when she began to scream. I jumped to my feet, my heart beating so hard it hurt. Marlene ran into the room, her eyes were wide and terrified. Run, she shrieked at me. Mariah, run. My feet didn't want to move, fear glued me to the floor. Marlene grabbed me around the waist, and we ran out the front door. There was no moon and barely any stars. Everything was black I had regained my ability to move. I ran fast, and so did Marlene. We had nearly reached Marlene's car when I looked back, and I saw her. It was a woman. She unfurled herself from the house, limbs dangling. She had to be at least 10 feet tall, and her pale skin gleamed in the dark. It didn't take her long to catch up to us, but it should have been me. Marlene pushed me hard, and I fell to the ground. She saved me, and I could only watch as the woman grabbed her and took her back inside the house. Marlene screamed so loud for so long, but it didn't matter. Mom and I lived on a street full of rotting or empty houses. There was nobody but us. The woman must have lived in the house all along. And when we moved in, we were the trespassers. We were encroaching on her territory. The last time I saw, Marlene was as the woman took her into the wardrobe. She wasn't screaming anymore, but blood was running from her nose. Her eyes were full of tears. I watched her, and she watched me. They never found Marlene. It's not as though they really looked for her. Her home was as broken as mine was. I dreamed of Marlene often. I dreamed that I watched as the woman held her in her fist and squeezed. I listened to her bones crunch and saw her intestines spill out of her mouth. Brain matter leaked out of her ears, and her eyes formed gelatinous tears on her cheeks. She had cared for and saved me. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. I looked for her every day until the day I left for college. I never found any trace of her. I saw traces of the woman, though. Occasionally, I would glimpse her from the corner of my eyes. Her long arms would creep into the room and then slither out of sight. Once, I saw her reflection in the mirror as I brushed my teeth. She only appeared when mom was out of the house, so I made sure never to be home alone. When I moved out, I moved across the country. I barely talked to mom. However, I spoke to Lizzie, my baby sister. Mom became pregnant with her when I was 17. I begged mom to move repeatedly, but she never listened to me. Lizzie was 10. I told her about the house, but never about the pale lady. I told her never to be alone, and she listened, she had been safe. But mom had gone to the bar during the night, and when she came home, Lizzie was gone. There were claw marks on the door and a dark stain on the bed. The wardrobe was partially askew. It had happened. The woman had taken her. Mom was drunk and half crazy in grief. She asked me what to do. Call the cops and look in the wardrobe, I told her. Find her. It might not be too late. She did and called back a moment later. They said they're on the way, she sobbed. Good. Are you by the wardrobe? Yes, yes. Oh, Mariah, her sock is on the floor. 
It's drenched with BBB blood. Oh, Mariah, you were right. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I hung up on her. I replayed the last conversation I had with my sister in my head. It would haunt me forever. Mariah, Lizzie whispered to me over the phone. Mariah! Mom's gone. What do you mean she's gone? It's almost midnight. I know. I woke up to go to the bathroom, and she's not here. Lizzie was near tears. I tried to stay calm for her, but it was hard. I felt dread crawling over my skin like a spider. I think she went to the bar again. She's been drinking a lot. No, I said, not bothering to censor myself. This was very bad. Where are you? I asked. I already knew. In the house, Lizzie whimpered. In the house alone. Lizzie, get out of the house now. Run, run until you're on the next street over. No run until you reach the bar. There should be people there. I'm on my way. I'm going to book a flight right now. I'm taking you to live with me. It sounded so easy, a fantastic plan. It would be okay, it would be fine. I would fly to my sister and bring her back with me. Everything would be okay. But it was too late. Fear immobilized Lizzie as it had with me all those years ago. I hear something, she whispered to me. There's something right outside the door. Mom? I said, hopefully knowing that it wasn't. No, no, Lizzie breathed, and her voice sounded muffled. It's not mom. I'm under the bed right now. It's a woman, she's, she's whispering to me. She gasped. She's in the room. She's talking to me. I couldn't say anything. I burst into tears. Lizzie was crying, too. She says she remembers you. She remembers hearing you scream and pound on the door. She says that every day you would walk around the house looking for the girl. The one she killed. Lizzie, stop talking. I yelled. Lizzie, I'm on my way. I grabbed my keys and ran to the door. Yes, I was in my pajamas, and yes, I was thousands of miles away, but I could save her. I could help my sister. I could help her like Marlene had helped me. It was quiet, and when Lizzie spoke again, her voice was strangely calm. She says that she watched you every single day in every single room. She says that you think you got away, but you didn't. She says she'll see you soon. I bought a digital camera. I don't know what to do about the horrible things I found inside. I made the purchase because it was an antique. Back in 2007, people could only use digital cameras to take pictures, which is why the world is so grainy in history books. It was on sale for $1.90 at a garage sale, but I talked them down to $1.30 because I'm watching my budget. I couldn't pass up the opportunity, though, because I saw that someone had left a SIM card in it. As I walked through the front door, I could tell that I was the only one home. So I headed straight to my room and pulled out the camera to see what was inside. The first few pics were just boring shit. Some creepy birthday clown, photos of two women drinking tea, a doctor talking to a group of other doctors at a random hospital, it was a strange mixture. Then I got to the boobies. Yep, someone had taken a bunch of sex pics. There's nothing quite like naked strangers, so I started scrolling even faster. Yippee kie, these people got nasty. We're talking bondage. Lots of it. Wait. The bound woman held the exact same limp pose in four consecutive shots. The next one had a bloody knife. A chill settled over me as I realized that the man in the photos had never shown his face. It's like he had intentionally been hiding himself. Vomit nearly hit my uvula as the next shot featured the woman cut into three pieces. Each of her legs had been cut off. I actually did puke a little when the following picture showed her head with its eyes missing. Why the hell was I still looking at this? I moved to the next picture. Her pale, gray skin was barely visible beneath the soil of a shallow grave. Only her face showed above the dirt, her open mouth now filled with mud. I checked the next shot and nearly fell over. It was a picture of the garage sale where I bought the camera. Today's date was in the corner. 
I scrolled to the following pic. Why the hell was I still looking? The shot featured this camera sitting on the table where I'd found it. I had no idea how it could have taken a picture of itself. I didn't think it could get any weirder. The next photo was of me, walking toward the table where I'd made the purchase. The following one showed me holding the camera. And the one after that was of me walking into my house, camera in hand, heading toward my room. The photographer was clearly standing in my hallway, but I didn't remember seeing anyone there. My mouth went completely dry. I wanted to run away, to melt into the floor and disappear, but I could only leave the house by passing through the hallway where the photographer had apparently been standing. I'm sitting here with my phone, praying that the sounds of footsteps in that hallway exist only in my imagination. But as I hear them moving up the walls to the ceiling, I know they're not. I'm a social worker for the homeless, and one case will haunt me for the rest of my life. I know what this is about, the man across my desk sneered. You're trying to find out why I'm a psycho or a junkie or a career criminal. You're trying to find out why I can't just live in a little plaster box and pay my taxes like everybody else. I'm trying to find out who you are, Marcus. I sighed. And I would never call anyone any of those things. A person is more than just the problems they face. Problems? You don't know shit about problems. I may not be like those people out there, he gestured to the other homeless waiting in hallway of the center, but I've got a big problem. That's why I'm here, Marcus. Why don't you talk to me about what's troubling you? Because I want to sleep under the stars tonight, not get dragged off to some padded cell in a straitjacket. I leaned forward and pushed up my glasses, stroking my chin like I just couldn't find the right thing to say. It was a disarming gesture that I found helped people to open up to me. As a social worker specializing in homelessness, I needed every helpful strategy that I could get. Most of the people I worked with viewed me at best as a waste of their time and at worst, as a threat. The more I understand, the more I'll be able to help. That's all I want, Marcus. To help you. Will you let me do that? The twenty-something blonde across the desk from me rolled his eyes, rubbed red and dark pitted from lack of sleep. Apart from that, however, Marcus wasn't a typical case. He was well-dressed and clean-shaven, even if his suit had seen better days and his eyes bore the rubbed red, dark pitted signs of insomnia. Look, if I talk about this, there might be consequences. Horrible consequences. It might even bring her into your life, and I don't want to be responsible for that. I've got enough shit to deal with already. Marcus grabbed the arms of his chair and pushed himself to his feet. If he walked out that door, I was sure I'd never get another chance to get him the help he needed. Marcus, it says in your file that you never sleep in the same place twice. Why is that? Marcus paused, his worn-out pack halfway up his back. Through its bulging seams, I could see his tent, sleeping bag, and clothing all packed neatly away inside. It's because of her, isn't it? Marcus sat back down. You have to promise me that I won't get locked up anywhere, the young man muttered gruffly. And that if I ever get picked up by the cops or whatever, you'll do your best to spring me the very next night. I need you to promise me all that and mean it. Look, I know it's a tall order, and it's okay to say no. I'll just walk out that door, you'll fill out your little form, and we can both pretend that this conversation never happened, as he looked across the desk at me with those soulful, sleepless blue eyes, I had the strangest feeling that he was the one taking pity on me. Marcus, I grabbed the young man's hand solemnly. I promise that I'll do everything in my power to meet your conditions, should they ever arise. Marcus looked around, as though to reassure himself that no one else was listening. The troubled expression on his face was one I recognized, he was struggling to convince himself to open his inner world to a stranger. I let him sit in silence for a while, knowing full well that at this point, what happened next was up to Marcus. Sometimes it's so right it feels wrong. He said suddenly. You ever been in a situation like that? You find the perfect job or the perfect girlfriend or the perfect opportunity, but there's something off about it, know what I mean? I nodded. It was like that with the apartment, Marcus went on. My lease was running out, and I couldn't find anywhere that wasn't an hour away from work or a total scam. 
Then I found it, two bedrooms, one and a half baths. Newly renovated, but in a handsome old building, it was so close to my work I could walk there. And the price, it was less than half of what I was used to seeing. I flipped through the contract, looking for a catch, but there wasn't one. The place was rented by a small property management group that only owned a few buildings. I seemed like a reliable renter, they said, and I guess they liked that. Marcus laughed bitterly. I still remember how it felt, looking around at those bare wooden floors and perfectly white, empty rooms. I still hear my gut instincts whispering to me, something is wrong here. Get out now! But what can I say? For 800 a month in the heart of downtown, I signed right away. I moved in a few days later after work. It was late, and I was too tired to mess with unpacking all those cardboard boxes. I fell asleep on the bare mattress without even bothering to take off my suit. Marcus rubbed his sleeve thoughtfully, and I realized he was referring to the same suit he was wearing now. I had horrible dreams that night, but try as I might, I couldn't remember any of them the following morning. Marcus shuddered. Then I noticed the footprints, it looked like some barefoot person had crossed the dusty floor and stood just inches away from where I'd been sleeping. Funny thing was, those bare footprints started from the wall and didn't turn back. Like whoever it was had walked out of solid brick, hovered over me all night, then disappeared. Was I creeped out? Sure, a little. But I also had to be at work in an hour, and I had no idea in which one of those damn boxes my coffee pot was hiding. The next night, a door slammed in the hallway and Marcus jumped. Look, do you mind if we walk and talk for this next part? I need a cigarette, and I'd really don't want to tell this part of the story indoors. Just in case. It was my policy to never meet outside the office, I'd heard horror stories of caseworkers who were robbed at gunpoint, stabbed with dirty needles, or simply got too attached or crossed the boundaries of professionalism in ways that ruined their careers. I don't know why I made an exception for Marcus. Perhaps I, too, needed some fresh air. There was something claustrophobic about his story, the way his eyes kept darting around the room. After work on the second day, I was beat. A picky client with a complicated problem had trapped me on the phone all day, and the stress burned the image of those creepy footprints right out of my mind. When I walked in the door I kicked off my shoes, chugged a glass of water, and fell onto the mattress face first. I only meant to take a little nap, then keep unpacking, but when I woke up, it was already dark in, and someone was chewing on my toes. I stopped walking. I know what you're thinking, Marcus sneered. It does sound crazy. My brain didn't want to accept it either. I didn't want to believe that a naked old woman with white hair hanging down past her waist was gnawing on my foot with a mouthful of twisted teeth. I yelled loud enough to wake up half a city block and kicked her right in the face, or at least, I tried to. My heel went through her like she wasn't even there. No matter how I kicked and squirmed and fought, it didn't matter, she just kept biting. When I ran away, she slithered after me on the floor like a boneless goddamn snake, always nibbling, licking blood out of the bite marks on my legs. I threw pots and knives, said the Lord's Prayer, even swatted at her with a broom. Nothing worked. In the end I ran out of the apartment, barefoot and bleeding, with two of my toes missing. Of course, my neighbors had called the cops, but when they went back inside with me, it was like she was never there. I was a mess, Marcus went on. I think I actually cried on the cop's shoulder. The hospital wanted to keep me for observation for a few days, and I said yes to everything. I mean, I sure as hell didn't want to go back to my place, and I was in no condition to work. Every time I looked at my feet, the reality of it hit me like a punch in the chest. A ghostly old woman really had walked out of the wall of my apartment, and she really had chewed off my two right toes. The cuts were as neat as though I'd been born without them, and there wasn't any blood in the apartment, either. It was like she'd lapped it all up. So no one else could see the old woman who attacked you? I summarized. It's not like I don't have proof. I can show you the missing toes if you want, Marcus knelt to take off his shoe. Hey, there's no need for that, I moved to stop him, and as I did, I felt a ragged gap in the flesh of the arm beneath his suit. During the few seconds that my fingers brushed against it, I couldn't help but notice that the gap was the same size and shape as a human mouth. Marcus stood, looking up at the sinking sun with a sigh. I thought I'd be safe in the hospital, who wouldn't? 
There are armed guards and nurses everywhere and emergency call buttons, but even with all that, I still expected to see her come crawling around the corner, a hungry smile on her rotting face. I hardly slept at all that first night. Maybe that's why I dozed off so quickly on the second. Marcus took a deep, shuddering breath. All I remember is the pain. The pain and her face. I'd left my arm hanging over the railing of the bed that second night and she just chomped down on it. Her tongue jabbed at my veins, thirsty for more blood. Her eyes rolled back in her head, her tangled hair and decrepit shook from the joy of it, then the nurses came running in, and she was gone. The chunk missing from my arm was the only proof that she was ever there. The doctors couldn't explain it, but after hearing my crazy story they didn't want to just let me go, either. In the end, I had to break out of the place. I made a mental note to check the hospital database for any record of Marcus' story. You wanted to know why I live on the street, right? Marcus' shout brought me back to reality. That I sat nervously in the back of the classroom, staring blankly at the clock on the wall. I had heard the rumors about the school, about the strange noises and unexplained sightings that took place within its walls, but I never thought I would experience it for myself. It was a Friday evening, and I had stayed late to finish up some schoolwork. The halls were empty, and I could hear the distant hum of the heating system as I made my way to the exit. But as I walked down the corridor, I heard something strange. It was a whisper, soft and barely audible, but it seemed to be coming from one of the classrooms. I hesitated, wondering if I should investigate, but my curiosity got the better of me. I pushed open the door, and as I stepped inside, the door slammed shut behind me. I tried to turn the knob, but it wouldn't budge. I was trapped. As I looked around the classroom, I could feel a cold sweat forming on my forehead. The desks and chairs were all in disarray, and the chalkboard was covered in strange symbols that I couldn't decipher. Suddenly, I heard a noise behind me, and I spun around, expecting to see someone or something standing there. But there was nothing. Just an empty classroom, and the feeling of eyes watching me from the darkness. I was trapped in that classroom for what felt like hours, with no way out and no explanation for what was happening. But just when I thought it was all over, something unexpected happened. The door suddenly creaked open, and a figure stepped inside. It was a janitor, who had come to lock up the school for the night. He seemed surprised to see me there, and quickly let me out of the classroom. As I stepped out into the hallway, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. But when I turned around, there was nothing there. It was as if the classroom had never even existed. I never talked about that night with anyone, afraid that they would think I was crazy. But every time I walked down that corridor, I could feel the presence of something lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim, 